This is Keys to the Shop, episode 238, Leading, Hiring, and Working with Your Coffee Tech with Highland Joseph of Espresso Partners. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Please do subscribe to this show if you have not done so already. You just hit subscribe wherever you get this podcast and be updated with new episodes. And uh, also, if you have the opportunity to rate or review this show on iTunes, that would be awesome as well. That helps uh, get the show up there in the rankings, get more people to find this great information. That'd be awesome. So thank you so much. And also, if you really want to spread the love, just share these episodes with a friend. Now, if you didn't know, Keys to the Shop offers consulting for you and your business. If you're looking to upgrade your operations, want to gain clarity around the problem that you're having, getting ready to expand, you might be looking to get into the coffee business or getting ready to open your own shop. Keys to the Shop Consulting can come alongside you and really help you gain the clarity you need and give you insights that will certainly help you avoid needless mistakes and really get the most out of your coffee business and coffee journey. This can be in-person training, consulting, and assessment of your business or over the phone where you sign up for regular coaching conversations with myself and we go over whatever is happening in your world and help you find solutions and really take things to the next level. So if any of that is interesting to you and you want to learn more about working with Keys to the Shop Consulting, just email me, chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C H R I S at keys to the shop.com. I'd love to hop on the phone with you and just chat, see how uh, I might be able to help you. So Look forward to talking with you. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is absolutely one of the best specialty coffee equipment suppliers that you could partner with for all of your coffee shop's commercial equipment needs. That goes from grinders to espresso machines, brewers, even restaurant equipment like undercounter refrigeration. They can really hook you up over at Prima Coffee. They get the best equipment from all over the world, and then they work closely with their customers to make sure that what they purchase actually fits their needs and, and does so very well. So go check out the website, prima-coffee.com. You'll see the great selection of equipment, but you also see a lot of great resources teaching you about the equipment and about coffee, because in the end, they are all about equipping you with the equipment and the knowledge to be successful in specialty coffee. So I highly recommend Prima Coffee as a partner with your business to help you with your commercial equipment needs, prima-coffee.com. This episode is also brought to you by the always wonderful Pacific Barista Series. This is the gold standard for plant-based performance beverages because they designed these for baristas, but also with an incredible amount of feedback from professionals from all over the world so that when this ends up on your counter and in your customer's cup, you know that you're going to get something that is balanced. It's not going to overwhelm the coffee flavor. It's going to have amazing texture and just perform on bar the way that you really hope a uh, performance plant-based beverage would. With options like almond, soy, oat, rice, hemp, and more, you know you're going to get something special that is going to be enjoyed by your customers. So check them out over at pacificfoods.com. Click on the link in the show notes to find out more information about how the Barista Series from Pacific can really elevate the plant-based offerings in your cafe. All right, everybody. So today we are going to be talking about the world of the coffee technician. Specifically, we are going to be focused on the traits of being a great coffee tech. If this is uh, something that you're interested in because you employ an in-house coffee tech as a roastery and cafe, um, helps uh, your wholesale clients fix their machines and helps you keep your equipment up and running, or you're looking to uh, hire a coffee tech and you want to understand a little bit about what to look for as well as how to work with a coffee tech, this is a great episode because we're going to be diving into some details about the uh, relationship between the coffee tech and the cafe. And like any relationship, it you know a good one starts with understanding. And to bring that understanding to the table, we're going to one of the best sources in the business, and that is Mr. Highland Joseph. Highland Joseph is a West Coast service manager for Espresso Partners, and he is also one of the founders and current chairs for the Coffee Technicians Guild, 
through the Specialty Coffee Association. Uh, Highland's career in coffee started in San Francisco in 1985 in a small cafe named the Blue Parrot Cafe. He was a dishwasher and training barista, and for the last 16 years now, he has worked as a service operations manager, serving both large and small customers through Espresso Partners. Uh, Through the Coffee Technicians Guild, he wants to show baristas, store managers, and people uh, passionate about coffee that there can be a career for them beyond the cafe. And today's conversation, again, is going to dive into some of the nuances of what it's like to work in that world and also give you some guidance on how to lead yourself as a technician, others in your employ as technicians, and also, again, uh, working with the people that you hire to come fix your espresso machines and, and the like. Uh, and so this is something that I don't think we talk enough about. And because Highland has so much experience in both the cafe world and the coffee tech world, he does a fantastic job bridging that gap and bringing understanding where we really need it. So I hope that you enjoy this episode. Here now is my interview with Highland Joseph of Espresso Partners. Well, Highland, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be on the show today. I'm, I'm super excited to talk about this topic with you. Uh, how are you? I'm good. It's a little smoky here in Santa Cruz. Man, 2020 is just not letting up, is it? <laughs> I, I'm literally expecting to wake up one morning and find the plague of frogs on my lawn. <laughs> the way it's going, Calvert. Or, you know, we've had blood red sky. We haven't had red rain yet, but any minute or, you know, um, uh, you know, it just blows me away how it's like every day you wake up and it's something new and it's not necessarily good. Oh my gosh. Well, um, <laughs> we get to talk about something like hopefully some preventative, um, things so we can experience less trauma with our equipment and, yeah. uh, you know, customers and stuff today. So, um, I, I was made aware of, of you and in, in your writing and just because I came across a, uh, repurposed, I think it was a repurposed article talking about hospitality for, uh, coffee techs. And I, I really am fascinated by that because the um, hospitality industry is, we are myopically maybe focused on just, you know, it's us and the customer, but outside of that, it's just business, business. And we end up burning a lot of bridges and other things, circuit boards probably too. But um, it, so it, this is the the main crux of our conversation today, uh, but I thought the points were so well made. So we dive into those in our conversation, but I, I want to get some backstory on your um, coffee history. You you spent a lot of time in uh, retail coffee and and then kind of parlayed that into uh, tech work where you uh, are primarily and like solely focused on that now. So talk a, a little bit about your journey and, and how it turn, took a turn for the tech side of things. Well, it, it was never... It was, like I said, if you ask anybody in coffee, we all landed here. No no one ever said, I want to go into the coffee business at, at this kind of level, even at the management level. So I was like, I just landed here. For me, I've always worked in coffee or food service to pay for college, to pay for school. I was What landed in here was I was on my way to medical school and life kind of threw me a loop. And then when I recovered, I realized that at my age, I would not finish med for 10 years and I'd have a massive student debt. I'd had a lot of success in specialty coffee. I mean, this was in the early 90s when there was an upstart called Starbucks that was really disrupting what we did. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by what Starbucks was doing, what Peace was doing, what Intelligentsia was doing. So I decided to stay with specialty coffee. My initial area was operations management and cafe management. And honestly, I loved working as a barista. My retirement dream is to have a small cafe that serves about 500 cups of coffee a day that I can work at because it's just, it's one of the most gratifying jobs in the world. Yeah. But I'm a father and I'm married. And when I had my second child, you, you have to take a hard look at the reality of supporting your family versus being the cool guy working in the coffee shop or being the operations manager for, for, for coffee shops. Notoriously or historically coffee shops don't pay incredibly well. So in 2006, I signed up with a local company called Pacific Espresso. The owner, Tim O'Connor, who's pretty well known in our industry, was kind enough to show me that there was a career well beyond being a barista and cafe management if you're passionate about specialty coffee. And he was really my mentor in training and developing as a tech. And since then, I'm, it'll be seven, 17, 18 years since I've been involved in the industry at that level this year. 
Wow. Well, congrats. So the the, the tech work um, was sort of a practical move into like making more money. But uh, I imagine your experience in uh, working as a barista and in cafes gave you a an edge, I guess, in looking at how you approach working in tech. I mean, did you feel that at the time that, you know, maybe you were a little bit more prepared than somebody who was just maybe, you know, a, a gearhead that wanted to turn into, you know, some kind of coffee profession but didn't have any um, hospitality experience prior? It's, it's, it's interesting because my start with Tim was as a sales manager. And what I found was that my ability to do sales in a coffee shop or food service environment was actually hampered by what I knew. Because when you walk into a coffee shop, the owner's going to sit there and throw every negative at you he can. <laughs> and it's, it's difficult. But from the historical perception, your mind's going to take the simplest answer. It's difficult to say, oh, well, I really think I can sell you my coffee. It's much easier when you have the experience to say, oh, I totally understand what you want to do and I, I won't sell you coffee. So it's easy. It, it was, I, I was not the greatest salesperson. <laughs> now, when you go into tech, it's different because you, I can tell my techs, this is how a manager sees you. This is how the facility person sees you. This is their expectation. So you have to remember that all a manager sees you is that you are a person who is going to fix their machine. The facilities person, person sees you as you are the person who's going to communicate to the manager how to fix the machine. So I can explain to the tech that this is what the manager sees. They don't see you as a tech. They see that your only role is to fix the machine. They want to know how you're going to fix the machine, why, and everything else. And they're super pissed at you because you are the person that we have all thrown under the bus with the bullseye on your back, and you've got to go in and tell that manager what's wrong. And he has no one else to take that frustration out on but you. So one of the most <laughs> difficult aspects of our job is getting our techs to understand what that means. Because a tech walks in, all he walks in thinking is, I'm just going to fix your machine. The manager walks in and says, here's Batman. He's going to take care of everything. So there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap between that communication level. And I, when I, one of my biggest frustrations with working with techs when I was in a manager was like, dude, tell me what's going on. Or the tech comes in, leaves, comes back, leaves, comes back. And it's like, you've been back and forth to your van 30 times. What did you do to my machine? <laughs> because when you see a machine break it broken down, it's like, oh, well, that's not going to work. Um, maybe you might want to let me know what's going on. And I was lucky enough. And I think that this is what every single manager and every single corporation should do. I worked for a company called Espresso Partners. And I was lucky enough at Espresso Partners where they did a two full day training on how your machines work, not how to repair them because that's a liability issue, but how your machines function, what are the key parts? Because a lot of our, our main office for Espresso Partners was in Michigan. My store, my single store was in California. So I didn't have a lot of corporate support. So I had to know this stuff. So I had an edge up. And it was also incredibly cost efficient because, well, hey, my steam lungs clogged. Most managers are like, oh, well, my steam lungs clogged. I'm going to send in a $200 service. I learned that if you soak your steam on overnight, you can avoid that service. Right, right. So that preventative maintenance aspect, right? Exactly. So now you're touching on something that I think a lot of us feel is are, are these unfair uh, expectations, not unfair, but maybe hidden expectations that people walk into with without knowing it, similar to the way a barista might, you know, not be aware of how a customer is viewing them, or a manager might not be aware of how a barista is viewing them. And so they're just operating with this, you know, happy simplicity in, in their mind, but all the while they're they're building up this angst for <laughs> in in the community of, of people they're serving. And so I guess, uh, you know, what what does that where does that come from when it comes to techs and people that have that expectation of of the tech to be a superhero to fix their problems is that something that is is just on the shoulders of retailers that they've created uh, or is that something that has been sold to retailers by tech companies and or say we will be your superheroes just you know sign on the line so we can we can get your money but we maybe can't follow up with that kind of <laughs> bravado i 
It's a tough one. I have found that, so for, let's talk the owner operator. I think there's an operational bias with the owner operators where even if they're not part of the service process, they put way more responsibility on that tech other than what his general responsibilities are, which is to fix the machine and communicate how to fix the machine. They expect a miracle. And then a lot of times when you're in a shop, and unfortunately I have done this, is, oh, you fixed my espresso machine. Can you look at my brewer and my grinder and everything else? And it's just like, that's not part of the process. <laughs> they have to understand that, you know, you, you know, you've got several layers of this that you address in one of your questions. They have to understand that there's several people in the, the process here. So the owner needs to understand there's a dispatch person who's looking at that tech going, hey, Bob, I need you on the next job. The, just the, you know, the, the owner's going, the owner of the business wants to get paid by the owner of the cafe. And the tech is under pressure from the dispatch person saying, when are you going to be done? What's going on? I need to get you to the next job. So it's this perfect storm of that can really result in poor communication and bad service. And it's not necessarily intended bad service, but it's perceived bad service. Right. Because that pressure is, is you know, you don't communicate that necessarily to the manager. Right. They don't know that pressure to them. Their world is all that matters and their, their timelines. Um, so when you approach tech work, then uh, it sounds like you have you know, your own approach that's informed by these unseen uh, forces or these relational forces. And so if you could I'd like sum up the way that you, um, like your approach to tech work as informed by that, like what, how would you say ideally you want uh, people to walk away thinking of an experience with you or one of your techs? It's That's a big question for when I want people to walk away with and I want them to walk away with without when, when my tech walks away I want the customer to see that the tech did what he the, our, our company and the tech promised that they would do even if you're going back you should be set at ease that you know what the problem is what parts will be there and when you're coming back it sounds very simple doesn't it yeah almost never happens <laughs> so but let me go back to your other question about tech perception is there's an uh, there's another when you're leading with large companies, a lot of large companies use subcontractors. So one of the, co I know several, and I've actually managed a subcontractor um, a group with Espresso Partners. One of the biggest difficulties with the subcontractors, you're hiring a subcontractor in Texas. I have subcontractors all over the United States. What the, the, this, the service company and the subcontractor has to, and, and the service tech from that company needs to understand is when we're sending you out into the field, you're representing my company. So there's a huge gap when I send Bob's espresso service in Texas for a job for one of my customers to do a job because they're not, they're not espresso partners. They're Bob's, they're our Bob's espresso service. So the, the trickle down of service expectations always disappears. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's, it's made more complicated too, by, I imagine the fact that we well, like a barista has the manager, and there's this elbow to elbow work where the culture sort of rubs off on everybody. You know, you have the the momentum of that, uh, the manual and the daily work and things like that. Uh, the tech work strikes me as something that's you know fairly remote, not necessarily a group of people all the time that hold each other accountable. Um, so there, it seems like the the cohesion of that culture is a little bit more difficult to achieve. Um, and so it would make sense, to, you know, if it's removed by states or even companies, uh, that it would be even more complex to, to manage that. And it kind of leads into the first point of, uh, where you're talking about hospitality in tech work, it, it, making a difference between, uh, professional and unprofessional, because in, in this culture, uh, you, you want people to give uh, this good service to a customer, but wh I mean, what does that mean for a tech? Because we kind of know what it means for baristas and, and cafe work, but professionalism versus unprofessionalism in tech work, what, what does that look like and how do you cultivate that? Well, I, 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 I actually kind of struggle with that question because it's actually a very interesting question. So let's start with, you have to remember that tech is a field representative for the organization. This goes back to your roaster and your, your, uh, your roaster comment. What's going on in the field service call is what the what the customer is going to perceive when that field tech is out in the field. That customer is going to perceive that as your organization. 
So whether that customer is in New York or whether that customer is three blocks from you, your tech as a field representative, he directly re represents what you're doing. So the story you get commonly about a tech, I, I get this call all the time. The guy showed up in a dirty sheet, dirty three, dirty t-shirt, looks like he just woke up, didn't have tools and parts. <laughs> and his plumber's butt was amazing. <laughs> so it, 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 a tech should be in a clean t-shirt. I don't necessarily advocate logo t-shirts because when you get into a machine, things get destroyed. A tech should have the right tools when he comes onto a job and a tech should stop, introduce himself. This is just basic courtesies. I'm Bob from Bob's Espresso Service. I'm here to service your machine for this issue. This is what most commonly happens. Where the hell have you been? I need to get my machine up and running. And this comes from the owner. And, oh, that's not the right machine. You would be really surprising how common it is. That's not the right machine. And then the, my favorite one is, well, did you try just turning the machine off and on again? And the owner will go, no. So the tech will go, he'll turn the machine off and then turn the machine back on. And because of the way a system works, when you suspend the electricity to a circuit, there's lots of solenoid and switches and everything in that circuit that will turn off. And when you turn off the machine, it turns off those switches and it'll decouple them. When you turn back on the machine, a lot of times it could just be a sticky switch. There's nothing like the face of an owner when you've just done that and the machine comes back <laughs> and just fine. And it's like, well, I don't think I should have to pay for service. It's like, yes, you do. You I, mean, I have one traditional coffee customer that has 280 stores. And one year they spent $10,000 turning the machine off and on again. No kidding. No kidding. I wouldn't, would not lie about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, it makes me so curious about the mindset going in here. Cause when you first talked about introducing yourself as a tech and common courtesy stuff, it, it creates in my mind, this scenario where you're going from job to job and you're in the zone. And so you can't like get yourself switched from job to job to like reintroduce yourself, be polite, et cetera. The same, we have the same thing happen in any profession where you're in the zone and you, you kind of forget what context you're in and you're blinded to that context or the nuances. Right. So like if, if, if imagine that the same thing might be true of an owner who is just forecasting the, the ruin of their business and all the customers that right. are going to be pissed off. And so they're like, there's no way it's something that simple. It has to be something catastrophic, like, you know, a right. comet hit it overnight or something. I mean, take into consideration your machine, your, your, your average espresso machine does 150 to $200 an hour. So when you're walking in, when, when you're, when you're hiring a tech, well, right there, you're probably agreeing to $200 an hour. The tech, every hour that the tech's not there, you're looking at $200 an hour loss in sales. Mm -hmm. Coupled by the fact that there's a Starbucks on the corner that all the customers that you're, that you're turning away today are going to. Yeah. So if you're not, it's, I've never seen a huge loss of customers for when, when you, when that happens, but I can remember, I remember this day really specifically when I was in Santa Cruz, I was running a, a really popular cafe. We were down for the morning. My next morning was a little slower. It always comes back. But about two weeks later, one of my favorite customers was coming out of the piece with a caramel macchiato. And I hadn't seen him in like, I hadn't seen him in like two weeks. And this was somebody that I, I was a drinking friend with. And I was like, dude, what the hell? I'm like, well, you have, they have caramel macchiatos and you don't. And I was like, well, there you go. Mm -hmm. And that's somebody that, well, okay. So you look at it. Well, I only lost, um, that one customer, that one customer spends $5 a day in your business. That one customer tells every single buddy that they know who says, where can you get a good cup of coffee? Well, this place. Now that one customer is delivering all that value to somebody else. Exactly. Right. Which brings up the point again, you mentioned briefly in the beginning about preventative maintenance being so important, uh, part of how you educate your, your clients so that they don't have to have that kind of downtime. Right. I mean, PM maintenance is always really interesting. It's an interesting sell and it's an interesting battle because you can, you, there's that something that, that, that a term band around called broke fix rate. Well, I, my machine only breaks four times a year and it costs less than a thousand dollars. So why would I spend a thousand dollars for a PM program? And it's like, again, when you buy a new machine, <clears throat> I'm constantly amazed that manufacturer that people sell new machines with a PM contract. It blows me away because it's like buying a new car. Pretty much your first five years of a car needs to be 
oil changes and that kind of thing. Your first five through two to three years of, of an espresso machine, gasket changes, check the system, everything else. <clears throat> so to a point, I can see a manufacturer roasters reticency about doing an early on PM program because to them, it doesn't make sense. But as the machine gets older, you have to do it. Right. And you right. have to, you have to replace those gaskets. You have to, because what sometimes I, I don't think the customers see is that these machines get touched upwards of 2000 times a day, 2000 times a day, someone will turn that button on 2000 times a day. Someone will put a port filter in that system 2000 times a day. Something, someone will make a drink at that point with that kind of usage, you need to really look at some kind of basic program just to have somebody come in and say, you're doing fine. Mm -hmm. We'll replace these gaskets. I, a lot of what we do for two of our customers is troubleshooting and saying, Hey, you're, um, um, you're over, you're over torquing your, your knob. So if you keep doing it, you're going to pay $300 for a new knob or stop doing it. I mean, there's so much equipment on an espresso machine, not a grinder that if baristas weren't so rough with it, you weren't, you wouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, that's a, that's a bitter pill to swallow. And it is. And, but yeah. again, let me interrupt you, but I was a barista. Like I said, I love working on a machine when you're in a zone I mean, I worked at a cafe where we made 800 drinks by noon and I was on the machine. When you're in a zone and you're lining up 20, 30 drinks at a time, it's super hard to go, I need to be delicate with this espresso machine. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. what, what they see is I'm putting this heavy stainless steel metal porta filter into this heavy stainless steel machine, touching these high tense, high tense plastic um, buttons. Nothing should go wrong. Yeah, and, it's, it's built to abuse in their mind. Right, and well, the other thing is that <clears throat> no owner takes water water quality into, consi into consideration. And I could literally, you get me and Marty on the phone with you, we could have a two hour talk about water quality <laughs> and espresso machines. I'll bet uh, there are some nightmarish pictures that I've seen out there from from techs in the field. And it underscores the importance of professionalism too and hospitality because you might be going in there to create a solution for something like a, a solenoid valve or something like that, but you also have to have a mindset and train a mindset in a tech to, um, you know, have the presence of mind to do more than just fix it, make suggestions, be a teacher in a, in right. a way, so that you're guiding people to something better rather than simply just walking in and out as, um, you know, a, a, like a robot. Right. Well, keep in mind, back to the, the first um, one of your other questions is the customer runs on cost efficiencies. So you want to do that. And I've had customers tell me that where I've been in a shop working on their machine and I've spent 15 minutes letting them know what they should do, everything else. And they've said, am I paying for this time? It's like, OK, dude, <laughs> I'm trying to help you. Right. I mean, in that and, case, you're you're I mean, is it something that you just give to them off the clock is as a bonus or i mean is it is it always something that they end up paying for if i had my own company and i've tried to and I, I think espresso espresso partners will do this ultimately is when they get your when you get an invoice you get a list of further recommendations right that it's makes it's really sense. easy to do it takes the tech 10 minutes there's a lot you can tell by just looking at like looking under the hood of an espresso machine i mean if you're looking at, a, at an element and you see that there's white buildup in the element then you know that you've got a water issue and you need to address it now do you need to address it today no but it will need to be addressed like i've got a machine in, Ca in capitola that has a leak at um at the group head really seriously it's white it's like it looks like snow <laughs> it's been going on for three years and every time we go to the shop to repair it Vernon's like well if it's not if not if it's not dangerous then i don't want to repair it well it's like okay right it's like okay it's not dangerous it's 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 affecting your efficiency on your shots of espresso which is a big deal now with it's been a big deal the last 10 years with third wave and if that thing just pokes and leaks at midnight I'm not coming out there till five, six o'clock in the morning to fix it. You're going to flood your store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, if I am interacting with somebody, uh, a professional in any 
capacity. They, if they just give me the service that they said they were going to give me, that's great. I'm, I'm happy. But if there's that little nuance of, of like making recommendations that's ever present, um, similar to how a barista, like there's a drink where, you know, drinking it a certain way is better that, you know, rather than stirring it, just sip it this way. Like if a customer gets that recommendation from a barista, guarantee they're going to have a better perception of that coffee shop as a result of that barista's recommendation. They didn't have to tell them how to, you know, drink it for optimum pleasure. But um, they're, they're, obviously they're concerned. They like, I want you to experience this drink well, or it just right. is, I want you to experience working this machine uh, it, to have joy doing it rather than just viewing it like this big money pit. Right. So <laughs> the barista comment is very interesting because it's one of the frustrating points I have, I've, I've, I've seen with the introduction of third wave. And I actually has experienced as a tech is I was at a shop in San Francisco. I'm a double espresso black coffee man. When you when you're in this industry for so long, at some point you will go through the mochas, the lattes, the cappuccinos, and decide pretty much a sign of a good cup is a double espresso or a cup of coffee. I was at a company at Ferry Building, and I just I was walking and really wanted an espresso in a paper cup. And I got in a. a I want to say a fight, but a big discussion with the barista who says the espresso is served best in a ceramic cup. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I understand that, but I'm with a friend and we're walking down the gallery. I'm like, could you give me a paper cup just this once? And the response was, well, let me get the manager. And <laughs> well, I, it was, I was blown away by this, but it's funny because I was, it was interesting because I get the guy, the per, I got the person's point. And I was like, I understand that, but I'm, I'm actually making a request. It, it got to the point where I actually knew the manager because I, he, I knew them from uh, uh, working with the Coffee Technicians Guild. And I respected that. I was like, dude, ultimately I've paid for the drink. If I ask the barista to pour it on my face, technically he should. Mm hmm Right, right. So there, yeah, there's a balance there. Absolutely. And I think Danny Meyer talks about, uh, you know, hospitality is for the customer and not, you know, done to them. And so there, obviously there's a balance there. But when, when you're talking about, you know, having a, a tech show hospitality, it's like you're balancing between what you know is best, what you're hired to do, and then also the, the expectations that the, um, the customer might have of you that are, somewhat reasonable and others that are, are are not reasonable. So being professional in that situation just seems like a moving target. Yeah, well, you again, back to my comment about the tech is the moving target. You're putting a lot. I, I don't think the owners of this uh, the service business truly understand what it means to throw a tech in that field. I think the company I work for, Espresso Partners, a lot of us were techs. All the service managers were techs. Some of the salespeople were techs. So when we're sending somebody out, we understand what they're going into. And unless your, your role is as, as a service tech, text manager is to say, give him every piece of information he needs to understand what he's walking into. I mean, I'll go to the point where like, I have a couple of loopy customers. Be careful what you're walking into. Like, this is yeah. what you're gonna expect. That's the kind of nuances that need to be communicated to a tech. Basically, you need to give the tech a brain dump of everything he needs to know to walk into that job. And it, it's impossible. So then take that the step further is how do you give that tech who's in another state the same information? I have a company that I'm working out, out, out with, with, with on the South right now. They despise the tech company that I'm sending their way, but they despise them because the tech company is not communicating what I'm telling them to communicate. It's mm. like, this is the details. We, with, with managing third parties difficulty because you're in any time in the line of communication, you're going to lose, um, uh, you're going to lose efficiency of communication. I did this test when I was a Boy Scout leader, where I lined up ten scouts, gave them one simple three-word sentence, and they told it to each other. And by the time we got to the tenth scout, the yep. end sentence was completely opposite of what the beginning sentence was. That's how communication works. So now I know this company that I'm working with. They're great techs. I have worked with some of them myself. They're a good company. They mean well. They're not profit. They're, they're not like, we just want to charge you and bill you and make it happen. They want to do good service. Because of the way they're translating my communication to the customer, the customer wants to kick them to the curb. Hmm. 
So part of what the, 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 the cafe customer needs to go is to ask, is setting up asking the right questions, is to not be on the defensive, is to say, what do you think it is? And then what can I do to help make it not happen again? I mean, there needs to be some impetus on the, ca on the cafe owner where it's like, what can I do to prevent this? There's a couple of companies out there like Pete's Coffee and Tea. I work with them on occasion. They are fantastic about preventative maintenance and maintaining their equipment. And I, they save a lot by doing that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and, it, and they ask they ask the right questions. You know, they will ask, you know, did this service need to be done? Could we have prevented it or could we have combined? And it's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. You could you could have. And then we look at it. And that's that's the kind of dialogue that you want, that you want with an organization. But, you know, some organizations are 300 units. Other organizations are 25,000. So how do you convey that at that level? I mean, I I believe it's doable, but. The question I ask myself as I work with some of my, my, my consulting clients is, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it makes sense because a, a place like Pete's Coffee and Tea has the systems in place to guarantee ROI for specific locations, and they would never think to probably let their equipment get so decrepit that you know, it would you know, cause the store to perform poorly because, I mean, that they didn't get there because they were sloppy with their systems. But, you know, the one or two shop, the mom and pop espresso shops seem to be the worst offenders when it comes to, to this. Even though they have less to manage, the, the systems are, are not necessarily there to create uh, that environment of controlling the quality of their, um, of their equipment over time. Right. And, yeah. So you made a point um, in this article that I read that was talking about how detail in communication is important in that – it makes me think people generally have the idea that they can just shoot low with information to the customer and say, well, basically they don't need to know this or I'll just really generalize. Uh, but it's really important for a tech to be detailed with the, the client, with a customer. I wonder if you can elaborate on what that means and maybe, Kami, can you go too far with that? Over... Um over communication tends to be unreliable information. Um, and it tends to, it te it's coming from a barista or a manager who might not have familiarity with the equipment. I mean, but what you, to speak to your question, you're looking at a chain of communication. So the owner needs to be understanding what's happening, but at the same time, the owner needs to be able to communicate what's happening to the tech before the service, the tech can arrive on time. It goes back to my comment about tech not having parts, tech not having what he needs. Well, did the dispatch person communicate what they needed? And did the service person, did the, um, did the, 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 the cafe manager communicate what was actually going wrong? Again, 70% of my service call diagnostics are the machine does not work. Okay, so the first question is what machine? <laughs> then what's not working? A, 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 an espresso machine is comprised of four systems, electrical, pressure, hot water, and extraction for the espresso machine. For the tech, the, the reason the tech needs to keep the details is you've got to have a paper trail if there's warrant issues or service quality issues. The next one is another tech might be returning on site to complete the repairs that the previous person did. So they need, to, they need a full understanding of the initial diagnostic and service. More times than not, I will hear the tech said, well, I showed up on site. I don't have the part, I have the parts, I don't know what to do. And that for me falls on dispatch and the service manager communicating accurately what the tech needs. To prevent a lot of these service issues, it falls on communication and making sure that the tech has everything that they need to walk in. There'll always be questions, but the dispatch and the service manager needs to make sure that they're ensuring that they have the answers to those questions in advance. And then lastly, billing needs to understand the service details to ensure accuracy of billing and any recommendations that they're going to present to the customer. Sure, there's a lot of liability there, and then you also have your own reputation to worry about, and right. you want your customer to be happy with everything that happens. And so y y forcing those details seems to be, uh, not forcing, but you know, extracting them, so to speak, uh, is, is obviously important. So y you touched on something that, you know, being on time, um, it seems like, you know, that's a 
seen as a small thing maybe in the tech world or i i just wonder where that comes from that a tech would be like well it's fine i can i can show up anytime i want like what's the mentality that uh lets people in that line of work think that being late or even not showing up is okay again it's it's a fine line because when you're a store manager and you're calling in you want the tech there now so california spread out i could have a job in santa cruz my tech could be up in livermore and working on a machine. So I'm, I have to tell my customer, he's two to three hours out. Here's when he'll get there. Then if you've ever been to California, we have wonderful traffic, depending on traffic. <laughs> so he, he shows up at four hours later, shows up four or five hours later because it was tracking. It was no fault to his own. The owner is going to take his vengeance out on the tech because he was late. Dispatch should have communicated to the owner that the tech was running late. Now, the, the other problem is, is as you're a dispatcher, you, 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 you have to risk some stuff. So I have that guy who's in Santa Cruz who has a machine that works. My tech's currently online in Livermore. I have another machine in Pleasanton that is down. The guy in Santa Cruz, well, his machine's working just fine. He's got a steam issue. He's a new customer. The guy in Pleasanton, his machine is down and he's a great customer. The dispatcher's responsible to evaluate the priority of that service. That's fair. But once the dispatcher evaluates the priority of that service and makes a change, they need to communicate it to both customers. We are not going to make it because we have a customer here who's not necessarily more important, but who's down. And it's, it's not a difficult, it's not an easy place to be because when the tech shows up the next day, a day late, because the dispatcher didn't communicate to him, you're going to be angry because mm-hmm. no one said my tech's going to be late. Then it's a lot of, a lot of the solutions. There's a lot, a lot of the solution here is preempting the fire is call and saying, my tech's going to be late call and saying, we don't have the parts call and saying, we don't have a tech who's trained, right. But we can send a tech who can troubleshoot it, who understands equipment. I mean, communication from the dispatch team is crucial in this. Because they're the center of because they're the center of communication, right? And if I was a owner and I was super concerned about it, I guess I, I would try to go as close to the originator, like the 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 chain of command, like on top of the chain of command as possible to figure out, like, I mean, maybe assume that everything is more complicated than it seems, and not necessarily have full faith that all details are going to be communicated. Just to check right. in with the dispatcher and say, like, well, well where are they? Now, you know, I've done this with. But, you know, when we run out of milk or something in a cafe and you call your your uh, distributor and they give you the number for the truck driver, it's like, well, <laughs> I'd rather talk to you uh, right. because you're the one who kind of, you know, hammers out the details here. And that might be annoying uh, to them at some level. But in, in my mind, it's actually... Yeah, maybe I'm doing them a service by highlighting a problem like why do our customers not want to talk to our uh, drivers? <laughs> Is it because there's a communication issue that we need to solve? I don't know. Just, it, But it makes sense. It's like a parallel to a lot of other areas in the coffee business. I've, I've actually had that experience with milk drivers yeah. and, 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 and milk sellers. So I had a milk driver uh, I had for about 20 years. I have about 15 years at one of my cafes and my the cafes I worked at. And I always used them. If I moved, I used these guys. So I had the guy's number. So the owner calls me yesterday, one day, super pissed off because I had called this guy and taken him off his route. And, mm. I, and that's fair enough. The guy's like, Hey, it's Highland. He's a great guy. I'm going to go give him, give him milk. But he ended up not getting it, being able to complete his route for the day. That's the purpose of the dispatcher. So I, I, and I learned my lesson on that because I, I, I had enough long-term relationships where I had my guy, but the problem with having your guy or calling your tech directly is you're completely destroying the line of communication. So you need to actually talk to the dispatcher and say, Hey, I need milk. If the dispatcher says, well, call Frank, then the dispatcher is implied that you can call Frank and change the schedule. Yeah. As, as retailers, and depending on where you are, you might have only one place that is, Um, uh, servicing your equipment, and maybe you have no place, or you have lots of options. There's lots of different situations, right? And and for those who 
um, see the opportunity either because there's nothing there or because they want to be competitive. They'll they'll try to start their own uh, tech in house tech for their wholesale customers. A lot of roasting companies have this. Right. Um, so there's two, two two areas that I want to dive into here with you, and hopefully you can give us some some insight on how to approach them. The first is how do we select the right uh, tech company in our area? If we've got some choices to make between different people who are certified to do the work, how does this process uh, work where we can choose something that will make us happy in the end and, and maybe not frustrated? It's a, it's a very interesting question. So now, now, keep in mind, we only get called when the house is on fire. <laughs> And if I can't take the call, my friend over here is going to get the call because the house is on fire. And that customer will circle the circle the field till he comes back to you and says, I can't, I, he can't do it. Can you do it? It's like any relationship. If you open a cafe, part of your to-do list should be, or if you're going to be a roaster with a service tech, part of your to-do list is to establish a relationship with that service tech, set up a meeting with him, show him your equipment, discuss the parts you're using, discuss the equipment you're using, and actually give him an estimated usage. This includes water systems. Now, as a roaster, it's, it's in interviewing a tech, it's most techs need to be trained. There's not a lot of coffee trained techs out there. That's one of the reasons the guild was found. So you need to make sure that the tech is trained. And then as a roaster, you need to know what every piece of equipment is that that store has so that you're ready to service them. Because there's a lot of parts on espresso machines that and, and brewers that work on several machines. So you can have a base kit. But if you know that Intelligentsia carries only Curtis's TP2s and they have 80 of them, you're going to want to carry a parts kit and you're going to want to contractually agree with Curtis, with um, your Intelligentsia roaster, what that parts kit is and what you will and will not serve. As you get bigger and bigger, it gets more to the point of discussing. When you have five cafes or six cafes, having a relationship with a permanent service partner is important. You establish SLAs, service level agreements, which is I've got a local guy here um, who owns three cafes, but if he calls me with an emergency, he pays an extra rate and I'm there within four hours. But that needs to be this, that needs to be really, really worked out. I recommend for every roaster that you have a service agreement with every customer. It might, buy, it might not be a contractually binding agreement, but it's agreement of what they can expect from you in writing. If you call us on Friday at midnight, they need to know that you're not gonna make it out there till Monday because you don't have all on-call text or they need to understand the on-call pricing. So, cause it's common, you know, Friday at seven, my machine dies. Okay, well, I'll come in and it's gonna be 150 to $400 for um to repair your machine well newer normally it's 200 dollars. well it's like i have to wake a tech up on a saturday that's overtime and you have to assume the cost so it's really important that people are preemptive here the benefits of having a roaster tech is you under you get a clear understanding of what's going on in your customers cafes and you understand the condition of the equipment but it's the responsibility of the roaster to know what that equipment is and to make sure that their tech is is trained to service that equipment. There's nothing worse than sending in a green text saying, well, I've never worked in this equipment before. You might want to call my friend here. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's happened. Right. So when you're looking for, uh, and the two scenarios, when you're looking for a tech, you've got to make sure that they're equipped to be able to handle exactly what right. you know, equipment you have. Right. And, you know, fact is, is that if you've got m multiple cafes, sometimes there isn't um, just one type of espresso machine. You know, I see this a lot where, People will become um, uh, larger up to like two or three cafes and they like try out different machines right. at, at those cafes. But then they get up to like four <clears> or five and they're like, well, you know what? We really need consistency. So we get all, all the same machines. And we'll just sell these other ones or, or whatever. Uh, so that could be pretty tricky to find somebody who's going to have the kind of um, flexibility to grow with you as you try things out and uh, that could be a kind of a daunting proposition. Uh, is that some kind of a challenge that we need to be aware of? It is. And it's because your the, the store planning teams, like in larger organizations, the store planning teams don't always discuss what they're using for equipment. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you're, let's, if you're going with a roaster, 
the roaster doesn't always say, I mean, a lot of roasters nowadays will say, if you're going to sell my coffee, you have to buy this specific equipment, part of it so they can service it. If you're a guy who's running a donut, a, a sandwich shop that does two, fit through two, three hundred dollars a day in coffee, you're not going to want to spend ten thousand dollars on a new platform. And parts are pretty well available these days. What I've seen in the in large organizations, fifty plus, is where you have this contract with them for these specific machines, and suddenly somebody in their R and D has said, well, "We're going to change out change out twenty of these machines and test them," and they don't tell you. And it doesn't look like you didn't know. It looks like you didn't take the effort to find out. So then you send a tech in there and it's like, well, we didn't know you guys had these machines. Right. Kind of embarrassing. And again, you as the manager, the dispatcher or the service company owner aren't sitting there in the t with, with the tech and the tech going having to explain this. The tech actually has to explain this. And the tech's going to jumble around. Techs are not the greatest communicators. Their brains are so tied up in getting that machine fixed that they sometimes don't know what to say. Now you're expecting them to explain why they can't serve the machine, that we weren't notified and everything else. Sure, and they're expecting mind reading, apparently. Yeah. And uh, it, it seems like the first thing that somebody might do in that situation as a tech is to sort of, pre it, maybe not to say, well, we can't do that, but I don't want to lose this sale, especially if you're the tech and you're like you're a one person operation. You would say, "Well, I'll figure it out," <laughs> um, and maybe over promise of what you can do because you don't want to be seen as somebody who doesn't know right. something. Yeah, I have to know everything. You know, right. um, that seems like a, a you know, you're between a rock and a hard place there because you don't want to seem incompetent, right. but you also don't want to, you know, f <laughs> be held to an unreasonable standard. Right. Well. Uh, to speak to the, the value of the value of a tech, every tech I know likes a challenge. So they're going to say, I'm happy to help and I will look into this machine and I will see if I can fix it. That could go heroically and the tech could, you know, find a button that needs to be pressed or a circuit that needs to be reset or a, a cleaning issue. Or that can go incredibly bad where the tech doesn't call tech support and goes so deep into the machine that you leave a box of parts in there and then we'll, and with the answer that we'll have a tech back in the next few days to fix this up for you. I've seen that. This tech support for manufacturers, there's some really good ones, but some are iffy at best. And because again, tech support's not there with you. They're looking, they're, they're the, the tech's trying to communicate what the service issue is and tech support's trying to figure it out from a computer in Tennessee. Okay, okay. So in, in a lot of our situations, I think that um, we we want to train somebody on our staff to be a tech for the company um, first. And then we are like, oh, well, you're good enough. We're going to send you over to La Marsoca. We'll get you some training there. We'll, we'll train you on this, that, and the other thing. It'll buy you a tool bag, and then you'll go to our wholesale accounts, but you also handle all the calls for the, um, for the cafes. And so if we're talking about developing our in-house tech, and doing it in a way that will also serve our um, our wholesale customers well. I mean, what would you say is key for owners and managers who are ultimately the people that are the bosses of the techs, but not necessarily tech experts? Um, how do they lead them well and help them develop themselves as professionals uh, without necessarily being expert on the equipment? If you have the right support network you don't have to be an expert on the equipment you can i mean i've i've my my one of my favorite stories here is i had a tech who um, worked for me for three years he came out of film school at uc santa cruz and had never touched a screwdriver and i gave him my vetting test and he actually did really well on what i was looking for which was communication and and just trying to actually tackle the problem and he turned out to be a really a really good tech so as an, as an owner, the first thing you want to do is really train them in the areas of customer service and communication. And then what you always start with is theory. Because to work on any machine, you can work on a lot of machines if you understand the basic theory. Understand basic electric, basic water, basic plumbing, basic pressure. There's a lot you can do with the machine by just looking at it. I know a lot of techs that can walk into a machine they've never seen and they can fix it. And then the third is get them, get them definitely specific training to what your primary equipment mix is. You can't get it all, but like you say, if you have 
31,000 Mar Marzocco machines in there, your tech needs to know how to do it. If you have 25 Franke machines out there, the tech will need to go and get specific training. And then there's open work, there's more work for the, the tech with warranty work through the organization if they can do that. Mm, I love that. I, I, and it really demystifies a little bit of it to know that there's there's a common uh, function that all of these machines have that, you know, the housing changes and maybe the location for some of the common things changes, but there's a unify, some unifying factor there and that communication. And owners should be pretty adept at teaching and uh, practicing that themselves with the people that they lead. So um, that should give some owners and, and operators confidence in, in leading their techs. Because what I see a lot is, the um, because it's so outside of the normal, you know, operational uh, world of a, of an owner that the the people are just kind of abandoned to their own devices and then checked in right. with in very infrequent doses, which is unfair to them as professionals. And also, it's probably going to be frustrating to you as an owner. Right. Well, like I mean, to speak to my experience at Pacific Espresso, I I did a lot of field time with the tech, got hurt a lot. But the owner actually sat me down and taught me several good lessons. And part of one of the strongest lessons that I learned, and I think a tech needs to understand this, is, is, is empathy. When you want, and I, you know, as a barista, I had become a little arrogant and I had become a little cocksure. And I forgot about this. But when the tech goes in, the key skill you, you need them to kind of understand it is empathy. Is they have to understand what this person's going through. They have to understand what the frustration is. They have to understand what this guy is going through because ultimately it's going to make the communication easier if you have that and you're able to do that. Agreed 100%. This whole conversation, I think, is is helpful to, to shed a, some light on something that is by its very nature, like you said, the house is on fire and these are very, you know, they can be um, thought about, but they're only thought about in extreme measures and the planfulness and the mindfulness, the development over time, all of that stuff can tend to be uh, under focused on, you know. Right. Uh, and so, uh, thank you so much for like opening up some of these topics for us. And I, I, my last question, I suppose, would be like as a as a way of perceiving the relationship between techs and the people uh, in the in the retail world. Like, how do we become at peace? <laughs> what is how, how do we you know play well with each other because we we need each other in this and we're all we're all in this together. And so, um, relationally speaking, what do you think is like the best way to move forward? It really boils boils down to the theme I've kind of trying to present for all parties, which is communication and empathy. Accuracy and transparent of, transparency of communication is crucial for all parties. If, if everybody's communicating honestly and accurately and being transparent about what's going on, it's going to make everything a lot easier when you put that tech into that burning house. For empathy, a service tech doesn't really know, know what it means to manage or own a cafe. Likewise, the cafe manager or the, or the owner of the business has no idea the pressure that that tech's feeling. I mean, by the most times when that tech arrives at that shop, they've already been on the road for four hours. Mm. So I think a little mutual empathy and respect will go a long way to improving that relationship. I mean, when you're hiring a tech, ideally you're hiring somebody, you're gonna have a relationship for the duration of the life of your cafe. Same way you hire a milk person. It's rare that if you, you're the, I had a milk person for 20, like I said, like, like 16 years when I was running cafes, Every time another milk person would say, I'm going to give you a 25% discount on your, um, on your milk and you'll have to order this much, this much, all, I would always go back to my guy and he'd go, yeah, sure, I'll match it. Or let's be honest, it's unrealistic. I can't match it. This is what I can do. I'm going to still go for the guy who got the relationship because he was willing to be honest with me and say, this is why he can't do it and explain it. The other guy's just trying to close a sale. He doesn't know, knows nothing about me. He doesn't know about the Saturday afternoon's milk runs that we need because of space. He doesn't know if we go through more low fat or non fat. This guy, the little extra cost is worth it because he understands my needs. And that's the mm -hmm. importance of building a relationship with a tech too. And a tech company is having them to understand what your needs are and making sure the communication transparency is really crucial. Man, oh, I love that it all comes back to relationship. Very, very appropriate. Yeah, yeah, it does. 
Hyland, um, thank you again. How can we stay in touch with you and uh, learn more about uh, maybe the um, uh, Technicians Guild and, and stuff like that? How can we read more of, of what you've written and so forth? Um, the best place to find me right now is my LinkedIn page. Okay. So we have a private blog that we do that we'll be um, putting out there in November um, for people to look at that have a lot of the stuff that we've written done. Plus the Coffee Technicians blog is really useful. Um, I also manage the Coffee Technicians Facebook page and we post a lot of cool tech stuff on there, even just minor stuff like explaining what parts are. And it's interesting to read um, what other techs write because it's mostly other techs. So we'll do, we'll do service challenges where I'll point, post a picture of what the problem is and I'll have techs all over the world saying this is what the issue is. Mm, that's fun. So, I mean, those are the three places you can find me right now. Perfect, perfect. Thank you again. Um, we'll sure. link to those in the show notes. Pleasure to have you on the show. Sure, I'm happy to help. Anything you ever need, give me a call. All right, well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode. There's so many great things that Highland discussed here. One of the things that I think was thematic through this whole time was communication. And it's no surprise that communication is a foundation of something like this, especially when so much is at stake yeah, there, it's already really stressful dealing with equipment as an operator. And now that you're dealing with equipment that's broken, like Highland points out several times, this is an emergency situation. And so our, our typical uh, reasoning skills and our ability to you know be more relational is kind of at a low at this point. And so being understanding, being clear, being communicative, and having a system for those things seems very, very important so that when the emergency does happen, we have a system to fall back on that will be able to uh, carry us through. And again, I'm, I'm grateful for this conversation because whether you're uh, looking to be able to uh, develop the culture for your techs in your own company, or you're looking to hire somebody that fits with the culture of your company and with the needs that you have as a, as a business, or maybe you're a coffee tech and you just need to know how to become a little bit more uh, in tune with your customers, I think this conversation has been super helpful. So a huge thank you to Highland Joseph for being on the show. We really appreciate your wisdom here. And you can find links to the uh, Coffee Technicians Guild as well as Espresso Partners in the show notes for this episode. Now, if you want to contact me, you can do so by emailing chris at keys to the shop.com with any comments, questions, and feedback. Or if you're interested in working with Keys to the Shop Consulting, it's chris at keys to the shop.com. Um, there's some cool stuff on the horizon for Keys to the Shop. We just started this um, Stories from the Ground series in partnership with Ground Control from Voga Coffee, the awesome ground control brewer. So uh, that episode was just released yesterday with Scott Carey. And we got a couple more of those coming out, one with 392 Cafe and then another with Coffee Project New York. So I hope you tune in for those. And also there's another series coming out on Keys to the Shop that is quite different than what we've done before and centered around sustainability. Just to give you a little more information, it's a four part series focusing on the farm, roasters and importers, cafes and the consumer. And I think you're really going to enjoy this series. It's part of the sustainability series from Biocaf. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, I hope that you have an awesome day. Thanks again for joining me. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>